Well, hey church, we're so glad that you decided to join us online today. Maybe you joined us for the first time at one of our Easter services last weekend. They were amazing with Rabbi Brian. Maybe you've been watching with us from the start of online church. However many streams you watched, however you found the service, we're so glad that you're here today. And we really hope you did have a special Easter weekend and that you were able to join us for one of our services. And hopefully your kids didn't have too much Easter eggs. Hopefully you didn't have too much Easter eggs. But if for whatever reason you missed our Easter services, be sure to get onto our YouTube page, River Santon, and catch up on the Easter services. We're really, really amazing. That's right. But you know, we have an incredible service this weekend. In fact, we've had an incredible weekend at church so far. On Friday, we had youth and young adults. And we have youth and young adults every week, except this time we recorded it live with some of our key leaders and volunteers. It was an incredible Friday night. Pastor Andre's word was amazing. In fact, even if you're older and you want to watch that on YouTube, whilst you're watching the last weekend's Easter services, watch that. It was amazing. And yesterday was Yesterday was special. Yes, yesterday we had, for the first time since lockdown, we had in-person baptisms right here on our Santon campus. It was actually incredible. You know, a number of people came along who were comfortable enough to be around here. And it was just special to be able to continue doing the work of the Lord in this season. In fact, continuing to do the work the week before that we had in-person child dedication. You see, we're a multi-generational church. We're a church that uh, we believe in baptism. We want to dedicate children and families and we want to equip young people and we want to equip the kids. That's why we have our kids church online children's church. It's got eight specific ministry. There's characters, the kids love it. In fact, I'm friends with some of the kids on teachers and when they go out in public, everyone's like, oh my gosh, it's teacher Ray, it's teacher Sonke. So if you've got kids, Get them a device and let them watch it. Let them get input. Let them grow in God's Word. And uh, before we get into worship today, we just want to encourage you, take a moment right now. Think of a friend, a family member, someone in your world that you can invite to church because you never know what might happen when you invite them and they sit under the teaching today. You know, people don't have an excuse anymore. I'm too busy. I'm not going to be able to make it. I don't know how to get to church. Church is wherever they are. Don't underestimate how we can reach someone. Just send them a link. Send them a YouTube link, a a website link. Uh, It could change their life. Everybody needs to keep hope alive. So as we worship, as we invite people, as we continue to reach, let's trust God today. Let's praise God, church. Amen. He's worthy of our praise. God, our freedom we sing. God, our freedom. You gave your son, Jesus. Love that won't leave us, you never fail. Hey. Oh. 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 One more time, we sing God our freedom. God our freedom. 
us, God. Your love never abandons us, God. Your love is here with us, God. In every trial, in everything we may be going through, God, we know, God, that you are with us, Lord. So we surrender, God. We surrender our heart. We freely give it to you, God. Our lives, we freely give it to you, God. As we worship now. We sing. Here I stand. Here I stand before you now. As honestly as I know how. I'm broken by the days gone by. Spirit help my soul to rise.
Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. It's Jesus, bring What a wonderful time of worship we've just had, church. You know, every time we worship together, God's presence does something special and something new in us. I hope you've been uplifted and you're expectant for what God will do during the rest of the service. You know, no matter what your week has looked like until now, something new can happen as we look to God. We all carry burdens of what has happened to us. Maybe. You've been burdened by illness and lack. Maybe you've been burdened because you don't know if you'll get that call back for that job that you interviewed for. Maybe you're burdened by an important relationship that is taking strain in your life. But God will not let us be shaken. In fact, Psalm 55 verse 22 says, Give your burdens to the Lord and He will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. The second part of this verse in the NIV says that he will not let the righteous be shaken. And you know, church, you don't have to be perfect to be righteous. If you know God, you are righteous because he's the one that makes us righteous. You don't need to have had a perfect week to call on him for help with anything that you are carrying right now. God delights in helping us with our burdens. So wherever you're streaming the service from, join me as we pray and remain unshaken. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the one who makes us righteous, Lord, and we can call on you at any point with anything that we are carrying, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you help us with our burdens today, Lord. We pray, Father, for those who are burdened um, with work, with business, um, with, with lack, Lord. We pray, Father, those who are, who are burdened with, with illnesses and sicknesses, Lord. We pray that you uplift people, Lord. We pray for your hand to touch uh, the lives of people right now, the bodies of people right now, Lord. We pray for new opportunities for you to do a new thing this week for your children in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as a church, we love praying for you. So if you have any prayer requests, remember you can send them on the app or on our website. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Kaizen, and that's so true. If you've got any prayer requests or praise reports, be sure to let us know so that our team can rejoice and pray with you through those situations. Well, I hope you had a good Easter weekend and that you were able to watch Rabbi Brian's ministry. Well, as we come around our time of offering, we wanted to express our gratitude for those of you that have continued to remain faithful in your tithes and offerings. It's allowed our church to continue to flourish in spreading the truths of the word. Today, my encouragement is from Proverbs 11:24. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. So one sows freely and gains more, and one doesn't sow freely and comes to poverty. The one action is a declaration of belief, and the other inaction is a declaration of unbelief. It's important that we remember, we are always sowing a seed. It's just the difference between sowing something, the one who gives freely, versus sowing nothing, the one who withholds unduly. But in both instances, a seed is sown. However, the outcome is clearly vastly different. This year, our theme for the year is keep hope alive. And hope is faith in the unseen. And not dissimilar to hope is that of seed. When we sow a seed, the fruit is also unseen. But when we sow a seed, it's a declaration of hope. As a church and personally, we've always sown in expectation. Pastor Andre recently showed us when we as a church sowed into another church, and that was in 2002. We've done that many times since then, and God continues to show His abundant blessing towards the church. When we sow a seed, we declare a number of things, but I've chosen three. Firstly, when we sow a seed, we declare there's a need greater than our own. It takes the focus off ourselves and reminds us we are part of something more than just our own world, that the need to reach people for Christ has never been greater. It allows us to die to self and not chase after the next one to as we may convince ourselves need, but it directs us off self onto others. Secondly, when we sow a seed, we declare we believe there is more to come. If a farmer stops sowing seed or if a restauranteur stops buying raw materials to produce food, 
that inaction would be a declaration, there's no belief, there's more to come. When we sow a seed, we remind ourselves, we do believe that in fact there's more to come. So in lack or abundance, sowing seed reminds us that our current blessing or difficulty is not our resting place. But in fact, when we sow a seed, we believe there is more to come. Thirdly and lastly, when we sow a seed, we declare we trust God to do what we can't. You see, God expects us to produce. Our responsibility is to do the best we can and be as faithful as we can. But when we sow a seed from the fruit of our labor, we are actually saying our real hope comes from God who supplies all we need. We declare that no matter how clever or how fortunate or unfortunate we may be, that God is the one who's able to change, multiply and improve our situation when we sow seed. Our decision and intention to sow seed declares what we really believe. And at times we may give out of habit, but we need to remember when we sow seed, we declare there's a need greater than our own. We declare we believe there's more to come and we declare we trust God to do what we can't. Well, I hope that encourages you today as you prepare your offering and sowing your seed and you can look towards the screen and we'll give you various different ways in which you can sow your seed today. Giving online is quick, easy and secure. Here's how. You can give straight through the Rivers app by selecting Give at the bottom of the screen. Select your campus and the amount you'd like to give and you'll be directed to SnapScan to complete your transaction. You can also give directly via SnapScan by scanning the code below. If you'd like to give via credit card, head over to our website and select Give Online. Finally, to give by EFT, use the details on the screen. Let's pray together as we bring our seed. Lord, we thank you for this incredible opportunity that we have to sow seed into your house, Lord God. And as we do that, Lord God, we'd ask you to bring special favor upon those families and those businesses that are finding themselves in difficult times, Lord God. We ask you to bring favor and blessing to them, Lord God. And we commit everyone here today that might be bringing a seed into your house. We pray that you bless them, Lord God, bless the families and bless the businesses in your precious almighty name. Amen. Well, hi, church. Glad to see you online with us again. We just wanted to take a couple of minutes to chat to you. And I wanted to mention I was at youth on Friday speaking to young adults and to youth. Wonderful to be in the building in Auditorium 2, speaking to some of our young people, the rest online. And then being at the baptism on Saturday, seeing people going through the waters of baptism. Two weeks prior to that, over 30 something uh, children were dedicated. So that was wonderful. Nice to have a bit of physical contact. It's so hard talking to the camera, talking to you online. We're desperate to get back to church. Now you've probably wondered as uh, many people have, you know, the government said 250, why didn't we open for Easter? I need to explain a couple of things to you today and we're going to do that together uh, so that you're on the same page with us and you understand how your church is thinking and what the plans are for the future. I firstly want to start by talking about the fact that it's important for us to respond to government correctly. There have been some churches who say they're going to open, it's nonsense, they, it's oppression, and people are saying casinos are open, you can go to a casino. Casino is different to a church, very different, and we need to be sensible. Most of all, we need to respect the government. Yes. Now, Apostle Vilma is going to read to you from Romans 13, which is a foundational scripture. One of the values of our church is we respect authority. Yeah. Amen. From verse 1 it reads, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. I would like to say that even if you don't agree with your authorities, uh, your government, even if you don't like them, that is immaterial. If we say we honor God, we need to honor authority because in that way we show that we love God and we obey God and um, it's, ju it's just an outworking isn't it Pastor Andre of how we serve the Lord it's actually not really about who we like or dislike it's about God in the first place yes that's true it's not about who we like or dislike because you can't say well I'll obey if I like them or I'll obey if I agree with them all authority is there by God, imperfect authority to bring regulation to society. So we respect what they're doing because we believe it is for the good of the church and will endure with it even though it is extremely hard. 
Now, you may have seen that Durban North and Belito and Centurion are open and uh, Santon and Carl Army aren't. Well, there's a big difference between the campuses. Those are smaller campuses with very much smaller auditoriums. This is a 3,000 seat auditorium that we're in. Carl Army is nearly 1,000 seats. So it's a very much bigger facility or facilities to run. It takes 70 volunteers inside this auditorium just to run the inside with all the infrastructure and ushers and 70 outside. That's the minimum. We usually have much more than that. But you can see there'll be 140 volunteers yes. already out of 250 yeah. people. And, and then, we've got kids on. Yes. And, uh, you know, with the many thousands and thousands that are watching online, it doesn't make sense, even if you have 10 services, to have people in the building when you can only touch so few because we're hardly touching our congregation many thousands are watching online so wanted to explain that to you that there is a difference between us and our other campuses and we've given them an opportunity to open and they're doing great and another thing is we're not sure if there's going to be a third wave or another spike we've seen in countries like Italy and France they just recently went into lockdown again other countries like Australia are open so we don't know we have to look at the weeks now after Easter to see what unfolds yeah. we think our government is being wise we will track that with them and see what they say we might go back to 100 or we now might be opened up if everything goes well God willing We'll just have to wait and see and we will keep you informed. And most important of all, what we do want to tell you that when we do open up, we will go to three morning services in Santon yeah. and three in Kailami. Evening services will fall away for the time being. It seems that people will come out in the morning. You know, we used to connect at night. We used to hang out, have coffee, meet people. There was a buzz in the auditorium and it gave a completely different atmosphere. It seems now more practical to get the three services done and uh, people can go home and you know with with curfew and with nighttime with a different lifestyle at the moment it's probably best not to do that until we get back to completely normal in the future then we'll consider going back to sunday nights so something to look forward to and just you know you can plan we'll keep you posted every week and tell you what's happening and church we just want to assure you that we take sanitizing very very seriously so we've got special sanitizer for the seats and the hand rest we will sanitize between services where your children are in kid zone the handrails wherever you find yourselves in the ladies and the gents restrooms we will be very very uh, particular about making sure that this is a safe environment to be and all we have to do now church is be patient keep on praying until we can be together again and worship God in this auditorium Well, there we go. Baptisms, dedications. We're nearly getting back to normal and we will keep you posted as we said. Now we're going to get to the word today and I want to take a moment to pray. You know, the Old Testament is so rich and we're going to look at that today. And it's rich in analogies and it says it was written afore for our instruction so we can gain benefit from it. But come pray with me today. Let's open our hearts to the word of God. Father, we pray that you would open our minds to the scriptures even as Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to the scriptures, open our minds that we might understand the scriptures, not only for its historical content, but it's for its spiritual value and for its application to our lives today. Speak to us all as we watch this online message today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, today I'm beginning a new series and I've entitled it Living Through Devastating Times. Living Through Devastating Times. We've all been through a very devastating season, and in fact, we're not through it yet. And to get through a devastating season takes certain skills and certain attitudes. You can't just carry on as normal. They, they, you need to have a certain disposition if you're going to get through it victoriously. The world has been devastated by COVID-19 and economies have been devastated, actually decimated. And uh, they say South Africa's economy has shrunk by 7%. That is quite drastic. And Africa has been set back in its progress and growth by 30 years. That's how serious the situation is that we are in and what we've been living through. And there've been huge losses in business, in travel, in uh, sport, 
stadiums are empty, in jobs, and the airlines are taking major strain. Now, a lady called Kimberly Chris Caden, she's the communications officer for the World Health Organization, she said this in October 2020. She said the economic and social disruption caused by the pandemic is devastating. Tens of millions of people are at risk of falling into extreme poverty, while the number of undernourished people, currently estimated at nearly 690 million, could increase by another 132 million by the end of 2020. Millions of enterprises face an existential threat. Nearly half of the world's 3.3 billion global workforce are at risk of losing their livelihoods. Without the means to earn an income during lockdowns, many are unable to feed themselves and their families. We are living in a devastating time. And you know, tourism and travel have been devastated. We can't fly, we can't travel around the world like we used to. And uh, it's predicted that 120 million jobs uh, are at risk in the travel industry. And uh, the economic damage is likely to exceed $1 trillion. That is a huge amount in rands. And we can feel like victims and we can feel, man, things have been devastated. What do we do? How do we respond? What kind of skills, what kind of attitudes do we need to have? Because, you know, in the minute you feel a victim, well, then you start to lose hope and we have to keep hope alive. And the president of the World Bank, David Malpass, he said this, and he reiterated what Kimberly Cascaden had said. He said the coronavirus has been a devastating blow for the world economy. 60 million could be pushed into extreme poverty. But he said the catastrophe could be overcome and that people were flexible and resilient. Now, here's the thing. Believers are flexible and resilient. He's saying people in general are, but more so, believers are flexible and resilient. So in the midst of this devastation, there's hope and we can bounce back. And then he went on to say this. He said, I'm an optimist over the long run that human nature is strong and innovation is real. The world is moving fast and connectivity has never been higher. And so that gives hope for the future. How many of you know, we don't need the World Bank to tell us that. We know that through Christ, no matter what devastation we face, we can live through it and we can overcome. So I now want to come to today's title and I've entitled it Starting Again When All Is Lost. You know, we've lived through a devastating time. There's been huge loss. And now we have to start again. And you know, the exact parallel of that is the flood of Noah in the scriptures. If you think of the flood of Noah and how everything was destroyed, people were destroyed, buildings were destroyed, infrastructure was destroyed, the farms were destroyed, the roadways, there were boulders and rubble. Everything would have been washed away and Noah would have come out of that and had to live through a devastating time. And we can learn lessons from what he did as we unpack the scriptures in just a moment. Think of this, the flood came without warning and Jesus actually refers to it quite profoundly in Matthew's gospel. He says, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then he says this, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. It was a sudden thing, just like we've experienced. Suddenly we're in lockdown, suddenly everything's changed and we've entered into a completely different world. We need to know how to respond. We're almost reeling with shock from the loss we've experienced. And he says here, uh, that is how it will be at the coming of the son of man. Two men will be in a field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Now he's talking about when he comes back again, that will happen. But nonetheless, we've experienced that too. There's come like a flood and uh, people that we work with, uh, one's taken and the other's left. People in our family, one brother gone and a brother or sister left. And we've experienced it in church life, in our nation, in our own families, and it's been like a flood. And we're gonna unpack a big passage of scripture in a moment. But before we get there, let's just think about the flood for a moment because many people consider it to be a myth. You know, and the more you think of a myth, well then it, there's no point reading it because, well, you know, it's just a fairy tale. Why are we reading that in the scriptures? But Jesus referred to the flood as being true. 
And the flood is a very real thing. And the ark was a very real thing too. They've built a model of the ark in Kentucky and you can actually go and view it and walk inside and see the structure of the ark and built it according to the dimensions of the Bible. And so shipbuilders still today follow roughly those dimensions. They are the perfect dimensions for building ships. And a couple of things about the ark and about the flood. Most people believe that the earth is millions and millions and millions of years old, but the Bible tells us that our history is about four to five thousand years. And so when we go back and date the ark, it's very important for us to understand who we are, how we ended up on the earth, and God's plan for mankind. And, uh, you know, before the flood, there was no radiation. That's why people lived so long. There was kind of like a water canopy around the earth and um, uh, everything was protected. There was a perfect climate all around the world. That's why when you travel and uh, you go to various parts of the world, they have museums with different things that are showing that the climate was one temperature. You know, there were tall redwood trees and uh, bristlecone pines were growing in the North Pole. One of the explorers that went and traveled up there uh, to the North Pole uh, Baron van Tol, in 1902, he found a 90-foot fruit-bearing plum tree fossil uh, in the North Pole. Uh, and that, that shows you that the flood really took place because before the flood, things were completely different. And there are numerous things, you know, uh, the, the world was like a greenhouse and so the dinosaurs flourished. And when that water can a canopy fell down with the rains, then that's when everything changed. And that's why we have oil under deserts because all the foliage was compressed under the water, uh, wherever you find a desert, you find oil and they found coal. So all the vegetation has been converted into fossil fuels. They've even found jewelry embedded in it. And then there's the London hammer. You know, they found that buried 21 meters underground embedded in a rock. And they say it's 400 million years old. Well, it's a hammer that a man used. And they say men only came onto the scene about a million years ago. So it doesn't add up. Whereas a hammer inside rock compressed underwater, uh, under, under millions of tons of water makes perfect sense. And I don't have time today, but there's lots of proof of this, you know. And uh, the bristle, bristle cone pine is the oldest tree in the world. And interestingly enough, the oldest tree in the world is only dated at 4,852 years. And that would have been exactly when Noah came out of the ark and planted seedlings. And so the evidence for the ark and the flood is very, very strong. And um, the Grand Canyon, how was that formed? Well, it's very clear it was formed by water massive amounts of water. And so we need to believe what the Bible says and not relegate it to myths and legends. We need to see what God did with man. And that's why when you study the flood in the pre-flood era, people lived to ripe old age. It's because there was the, the barometric pressure was different. Even the patriarchs lived a longer life. You know, Sarah had a baby at 90 and at 85, Caleb says this, I am as I was before. In other words, I'm no different to when I was younger. The strength of a man was different in his old age because the earth was different. The ark is real, the flood is real, and we can learn a lot from it because it teaches us how to live through devastation. Now, we're going to read from Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1 and stay with me. We're going to read now the post-devastation era where Noah came out of the ark. And I love what it starts with in chapter eight. It says, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed and the rain stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Must have been amazing. Everything's gone. And all you can see are these tips of little mountains. And you, you must know how much water is underneath you. And then it says, after 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground, but the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. Notice this, he waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, then its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. 
But notice it says again, he waited seven more days and sent the dove out again. But this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. By the way, this is exactly one year later. One year he had spent on that ark with just his family and animals for company. Must have been quite a smell, I think. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. And that's what God's saying to us. Come out of that season now. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon it. See, after every era of devastation, there should be multiplication and it's built into creation. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Didn't plant his fields, didn't start a business, sacrificed to the Lord. Verse 21, it says, The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. Take note of that. People say people are born good. No, they're not. From childhood, we have evil intent. That's why we need laws and commandments. We need God's word. We need God's spirit. And that's why mankind is in serious trouble because we've just relegated that to the sidelines and think we can live according to our own rules. And then God goes on to say, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Now notice what he says. As long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Then in chapter 9 verse 1, just a couple more verses here. Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves upon the ground and upon all the fish of the sea. And they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. I know there's some people who say that we should be vegans and that God created us to be vegans, but it clearly says here that we can eat meat and it's not wrong to eat meat. It's not a morally wrong thing to do. It nourishes us and is good for our diet. Just as I gave you the green plants, he says, I now give you everything. The King James Version here in verse 20 of chapter 9 says this, And Noah began to be a husbandman, in other words, a farmer. And he planted a vineyard. Notice it says he began to be. And he planted a vineyard, and when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent, this good, righteous man. And then verse 28, we skip down to, and we're nearly done. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. Well, when we read the story of the flood and the devastation that Noah came out onto, he was probably, if you like to say, left high and dry. And he had to start over again, and he had to make adjustments. He had to adapt himself. And it must have been a massive undertaking to clear the mess and the damage and to rebuild everything and to start from scratch with a home and a family and animals and domestication and farming and so on. And he did certain things that we can do. And I've got seven of them and we're going to take a couple of minutes briefly to look at each of them. And the first lesson we can learn from what Noah did when he lived through devastation is never spend all you have, use some to stay afloat in stormy times. Never spend all you have, use some to stay afloat in stormy times. Noah built into the ark and prepared something for the stormy times, the devastation that was coming, but he also stored food on the ark and he saved up so that they could spend an entire year on the ark and get through that devastating season. You know, it's sad that many poor people don't have reserves and so when devastation comes, they are the hardest hit 
But even for people with means, we live right on the edge. And as a result, when devastating times come, we complain, we ask God, why is this happening? We blame government, we complain to family and friends. But it's because we've used everything up and we thought that times would always be good. But the Bible warns that we will live through many devastating seasons. And we mustn't spend all we have. We must keep some to stay afloat in difficult times. Noah built both spiritually by building the ark for his protection, listening to God, but he also built materially by filling it and storing up in it enough to last him for a year. And uh, there's a saying that goes like this. They say that when everyone's stocks went into liquidation, Noah stayed afloat. Isn't that the truth? He had something to sustain him in devastating times. And he invested his money in the kingdom and he built into the ark and he stored in the ark and that's how he got through the difficult times. And I think the lesson we're learning from these difficult times is we need to both build spiritually into our lives, not just materially, but also we need to look after the material aspect and make sure we've got reserves should anything go wrong. It can happen in an instant and it comes without warning. The second thing we learn is this, be patient and don't rush into the future. You see, Noah was in the ark for an entire year with the animals and with his family, kind of in a lockdown situation, a very long time, an entire year. And when you study the scriptures, you'll see that it lasted a long time. But when the rain stopped from the seventh month to the 10th month, he waited. He didn't say, let's get out of here, let's get going. He was careful and hesitant and he tested the waters to see the level of danger. You know, we've been in lockdown levels and some have kind of said we need to get out of those levels and we should carry on as before. And there's been a bit of a recklessness that has come uh, from some quarters. But Noah was extremely careful. He tested the waters. He waited. He watched to see and and it was perfectly ready. He made sure, if you like, that it was fully over. You see, the rain had stopped a long time ago but he only went out when he was absolutely sure that it was safe to do so. And you know, as we have said, we're in lockdown. Church is closed. Some of our campuses are open. People say, you should open. I'm coming to church without a mask. And some people have spoken like that and they, that, that they feel brave. But Noah was very careful. He recognized that there was devastation. Maybe there was going to be pollution. Maybe there was going to be bodies lying around. I don't know, but God gave him a sense. You need to be careful. And then the Lord said to him, he heard the word of the Lord, come out now. And then he came out of the ark. And we need to follow the word of the Lord. We need, to, we need to follow the authority of scripture regarding obeying authority, as we've said. And we need to be people who are careful as we step forward and we go into a new season. Psychologists have said this. They have said that a willingness to wait is a major sign of maturity in a person. You see, Noah was 600 years old. He knew something about waiting. He had to to wait for the flood. He had to build that ark. He had learned patience. And now he was patient before he stepped out and got on with the job again. Proverbs 21 and verse five remind us, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. You see, we can't just rush out, rush into business ventures and rush ahead as though nothing has happened. We need to be careful. We need to wear our masks, we need to be uh, safe, sanitize our hands, and before we can get back into dense community, we need to take careful steps. And you know, we can learn lessons from this that can tide us into the future. I was reading about Dave Ramsey, who uh, was a property uh, developer and uh, had a real estate empire, and he went bankrupt. And after his bankruptcy, he didn't then recover and go straight back into property again. He learned some lessons from going bankrupt and he started to study. He went to seminars, workshops, and he looked at people's personal financial problems. And then he began to be a counselor in his church to help uh, Christians get through financial challenges. And as a result of the difficulties he went through, the devastating times, he learned to manage money better. And today he's an expert in helping us manage our money better. Don't live right on the edge, don't use it all up, but save and stay afloat during difficult times. Number three, the third thing we can learn from Noah is this, be grateful you are still alive to start again. You know, many people get bitter when they go through hard times. We have to start all over. I've lost my job. What am I going to do? Those are understandable emotions. And we all feel that to a large degree. But you know what? 
God chose Noah, and the Bible says, and God remembered Noah, and then the rain stopped. And God has brought us through, those of us who are alive, who haven't been affected by COVID, who are still here, we should be grateful. We shouldn't complain, ask God questions. We should say, hey, we've got through this. Things are different now. Things have been devastated, but we're here. God must have a purpose. He had a purpose for Noah. He brought him through. He must have a purpose and a plan for our lives. And you know, when Noah came out of that ark, the first thing he did was he was grateful and he built an altar to the Lord. God was first in his life. And we need to have an attitude of gratitude because we may be tired, we may be frustrated, it may be in a difficult season, but God has brought us through it and we're still here. You see, no matter the storm, when we stay with God, there's always a rainbow waiting. And there are three dangers that we face. We can underestimate what we've just been through. You know, it's nothing. Or we can exaggerate what we've just been through. Man, this is the most devastating thing that's ever happened in my whole life. Maybe it is. But here the third thing is the, da- the most dangerous. We can aggravate it by complaining. So we underestimate, then we exaggerate, but then we aggravate it by complaining and complaining and complaining. And we need to get past those things and say, no, I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to thank God that I'm alive. I've lost loved ones. I've lost friends. I've lost a job. I've lost income. Things are not the same. It's been a very challenging time for me emotionally, but I thank God that he's brought me through. You know, God had brought Noah through for an entire year. He had enough provision on that ark to eat and stay alive. And if you're here today watching this broadcast, then you know that God has brought you through and you need to be grateful to him for it. We mustn't look at what we've lost. We must look at what we still have. Years ago, Dr. Neil Chadwick said something interesting, and I want to read it to you. He says, if you have a roof over your head, food in the fridge, clothes to wear, a place to sleep, we are richer than 75% of the world. If we have money in the bank, in our wallet, and some change in a dish, then we're among the top 8% of the world's wealthy. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, then you are more blessed than the one million people who will not survive this week. Gosh, we've got to be grateful. And Noah came out with a spirit of gratitude. It had been a devastating time, but he was grateful to God. And uh, you need to be grateful to God that you're still alive because when you're alive, you have opportunity. Let me remind you of what the psalmist says in Psalm 124. He says, if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, They would have swallowed us alive when their anger fled against us. Watch this. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us, would have swept us away. He uses terms there of water, of a flood. In other words, when hard times come, when things are against you, it can be like a flood. You can feel like you're drowning. But if you get through it and you bob up again, you need to be grateful. Remember Jonah when he found himself spat out of the whale and he found himself underwater, but suddenly God's grace had brought him out alive. You know, he was negative and miserable later on, but right away he begins to give thanks. In Jonah chapter two, he says, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And so Jonah is grateful. And you know, when you come through something so difficult, there's massive disadvantages afterwards. There are huge disadvantages in our world right now because of COVID. Everything is different. And when Noah came out of the ark, everything was different. The barometric pressure had, had, had decreased and it was a lot lower, 2.5 times lower than it was before the flood. But nonetheless, he was grateful even though he was in a completely different world, he was grateful. And you know, hard times can make you grateful, they can teach you lessons, or they can make you bitter. You know, most of us would know the story of Florence Nightingale. She was born in London to a very wealthy family. But you know, by the age of 31, where most people are well established in in their lives, she, she was known to have said, I can see nothing I desire 
other than death. She had no purpose for her life. She wasn't grateful for being alive, grateful for being in a wealthy family, being privileged. Then the Crimean War broke out and she began to serve in the Crimean War as a nurse. And there she saw devastation and death. And she was grateful suddenly that she had life and that she had a purpose and she had a role to play. Then about three years later, she wrote documents in 1859 on how hospitals should be managed and run. And those benefits are still with us today in the hospitals that are around now. She had lost sight of her purpose and of her meaning, but after going through devastation and seeing devastation, she suddenly realized, man, I need to be grateful for life. You know, some of us, we don't realize the value of hard times. Hard times are there to teach you uh, how wonderful the good times are because we often take good times for granted. And I was thinking about this analogy the other day. You know, when you make a mug out of clay, it stays clay until you put it in a furnace and you heat it white hot. Then suddenly it bakes and it turns into porcelain and it becomes hard and rigid and durable and usable. And often when we go through hard times, we don't realize that that fire was not meant to destroy us, but it was meant to strengthen us and make us more durable and that there's value and that when we come through the other side, we need to say, I learned something from that. I'm a better person for it and I'm gonna give thanks to God. I'm not gonna be bitter and behave like a victim. Number four, the fourth thing that Noah did, and I hope you're getting benefit from this today, is don't allow loss to relegate your worship and giving to second place. Now, the first thing Noah did after he came out of the ark, and it says in verse 20, he built an altar and he sacrificed on it to the Lord. He didn't start a business, didn't look around for food, didn't look for a place to build a home, didn't survey where he could plant again, because you know it takes a long time to plant and for plants to grow and then for, for harvest. So, you know, thinking long term would have been a good thing. No, the first thing he did was, I've been through a time of tremendous challenge. There's devastation around me, but I've got to put God first. And on that altar, you know, even though they didn't have much, they only had a limited amount of animals. It says he offered clean animals, and clean birds. He didn't offer the unclean. He gave God the best. And he could have come out of the ark bitter. He could have come out stingy, fearful, and held back. But instead, it says he offered a sacrifice to the Lord. And he knew what God required. God required clean animals. And so he gave God what God had asked for. He gave God what was right. And he didn't make excuses. You see, even in times of famine, since Noah, God's men have always put God first. The story of Elijah and the widow. Elijah comes to her and she's only got a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour and, and, and they've been through a devastating time. And uh, he says to her, make me first. In fact, let me read you the text from 1 Kings. It says, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and cook that last meal. But bake me a little loaf of bread first. In other words, put God first. And then afterwards, there will be still enough food for you and your son. The reminder of the principle that when times are tough and there's fear of lack, it's always to make sure that we keep God first. In Proverbs, as I said, Solomon mentions this. In everything you do, put God first. Well, what happens when you put God first? Well, he learned it probably from Noah. And he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of your income. And what will happen? Well, like Noah, and he will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. You see, don't allow loss to relegate your worship and your giving to second place. Noah came out and worshiped God, put an offering on the altar and gave God the first and gave God the best. Number five, the fifth thing to do after we've been through devastating times, and I'm gonna go a bit quicker here, is be prepared to put in lots of hard work and adapt to change. We've got to put in a lot of hard work right now after having been through a devastating season and Noah had to do it too. And he had to adapt to change. Remember, Noah had been a boat builder for 120 years. 120 years, that's longer than most of our careers. And he was good at it and it had saved his family and they'd been on it for one year so it was a pretty durable uh, piece of work that he had done. But now things were different and he had to work again. He must have been weary. I've been building this huge thing with my family. Uh, can't I just chill now? And he had to adapt because everything was different. And the Bible says that he came out and as the King James says, he began to be a husbandman. In other words, he began to plant and he planted vines and grapes and, and other crops. 
And so he had to completely change what he was doing before. And you know, we're living in a season where we might have to change. Our businesses are different. We may have lost our jobs, our careers. There's been devastation. We can't just sit around and wait. No, we have to, we have to be prepared to put in lots of hard work. Even though we've worked hard to build something, you might feel, well, it was all wasted. And you know, I, I, I'm old now. Well, no, we're 600 years old. And he still lived 350 years. So he made a whole new life for himself and he adapted. And you know, church, that's what he did. That's what we have to do. And many companies have done that. People have built companies up and they've become prestige brands. And then suddenly it's all gone wrong and they've had to adapt. Let me just mention four of them to you today. The Lego brand that we all know so well. You know, they did so, so well in 2003. Uh, Lego found itself after doing incredibly well 800 million dollars in debt and their sales were down here on here by 30 percent people were not buying as much lego as they did in the previous years and so they appointed a new ceo a man called vig nudsdorp and uh, he started by reducing the theme parks that lego had built and getting out of things that were causing them loss and also by producing less pieces of lego because they began producing so many different varieties he scaled it down to just the essentials and uh, then they also did something interesting they did crowdsourcing where they went to the public and said come up with ideas and if your idea sells we'll give you one percent of the profits well people began to write in and give them ideas and lego took off and uh, by 2010, the profits had actually quadrupled and they outstripped Apple's profits for that year. From being $800 million in debt, they turned it around. Why? They adapted and they made changes because nothing lasts. Here's another company, Marvel. They were once the king of comic books. Comics were selling and selling. Every child growing up, I remember having stacks of comics. But by the 1990s, a general collapse in comic book sales left them with a massive debt and by 1996 Marvel filed for bankruptcy. Well they appointed a new CEO and he didn't focus on comics he just focused on the brand and what they had and they went into movies and they started selling their scripts to movies their comics the rights to use their comics to movies and uh, by 2007 Iron Man was released and it made 585 million dollars and uh, it wasn't long after that that Disney came courting and offered them 4.3 billion to buy out Marvel. From being comic books, outdated, devastation came, but they reinvented themselves and they adapted. That's what Noah did. And you and I need to adapt. Let me tell you another one. Many of you would remember Nintendo. They dominated the world of handheld consoles and uh, they sold one billion game cartridges worldwide uh, with their Game Boy and uh, Super Nintendo, some of you would remember. But Sony came along with PlayStation and suddenly Nintendo didn't feature anymore and they, they, their sales just plummeted. They had to adapt, they had to reinvent themselves. So they came up with the Wii and it was a new way of gaming. It was different, it was sensory. It took the market by storm and they reinvented their brand by changing and by adapting. One more, how many of you remember Old Spice? Well, Old Spice was a very popular brand, but it's, it wasn't considered cool. It reminded people of, of men with hairy chests and medallions. And soon Old Spice, which was launched in the 30s, was super popular in the 60s and 70s. Soon it was a fading brand relegated to lower end stores. What they did is they had to adapt. They started targeting people who'd never heard of Old Spice. They targeted the younger generation. And today, both the older and younger generation are buying Old Spice again. It's revived itself and it started with a clean slate and it's a top selling brand in the world today. You see, when there's been devastation, you can't just sit down and cry. You've got to put in hard work, you've got to reinvent yourself, you've got to adapt and you can pick up and you can go again. That's what Noah did. Number six, quickly here, yeah. apply God's timeless principles and expect his blessing again. You know, when Noah came out of the ark, the Lord reminded him and said to him, there are eight things that are gonna carry on don't worry, no, the eight things that are going to carry on. As long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never 
cease. In other words, this world still works, Noah. If you plant, you will reap. If you sow, you will reap. Noah, the world as you know it, there will be multiplication. If you release these animals, they will multiply. There'll be food for you in the ground, food for you from the animals. Just get busy and God's timeless principles that he's put in place will keep working and you can expect blessing once again. You know, some of us have become so hopeless and so fearful that we, we hear all the doom reports. Every time you watch a nature program or you watch uh, National Geographic or the History Channel or you read articles, it's all about how the world is being destroyed. The earth is collapsing and we're, we're destroying the ozone and everyone is fearful and we've just been through a pandemic and there's no hope for the future. But God says to know there's been devastation. Don't panic. My timeless principles will work until I decide it, it's the end of this world. So keep sowing and expect my blessing again. Don't live in devastation. Rise up out of it because I'm here to work with you when you put in the work and you can reap again and you can be blessed again. And I want to say to you today, church, that we can be blessed. We can enjoy prosperity. We can enjoy favor. We can recover. Hard times come and hard times go. Devastation comes and devastation goes. And often you have to start when all is lost, but we can do it because God is there to help us. And when you get on with it, don't sit around waiting. Number seven, don't be afraid to make mistakes. I'm nearly done here, but you know what? Many of us, when we've been through devastation, we are so afraid of doing anything else because look what went wrong. Look how my life went wrong. I've been working to build a career and a business and look how it's all gone wrong. And we can end up almost uh, uh, frozen, almost uh, depleted of energy and, and motivation. But Noah got up and he started a brand new career. He planted vines. And guess what? This righteous man made a massive mistake. He didn't realize that the barometric pressure that had been around the earth, this, this kind of uh, um, uh, one climate and, and the pressure, that's why they lived long, it had suddenly been reduced. And so when you drank wine, you got drunk from it. And Noah planted vines and he drank the produce and he got drunk and he lay in his tent uncovered. And Ham, one of his sons, came in and saw him naked and went and called the brothers and showed them, look, our dad is naked, and pointed out his mistake. And the two brothers went in backwards and covered him up. And you know what? Today we live in a world where people make mistakes and people consider it noble to uncover other people and expose them. I want to encourage you, don't, when you see other people's faults, don't expose them. Don't uncover them. When you see your own faults, don't uncover them. Just get up again and go on. And despite the fact that Noah was righteous, he was a godly man, God saved him and his family, he still made mistakes. And that's the nature of life. Life is filled with devastation. It's filled with challenges, sickness, and mistakes. But we've got to go again and believe for prosperity and believe that we can recover and we can make our world a better place. I want to encourage you, don't go along with the world and its negativity. Look to God despite our devastation and let's bounce back with confidence and rebuild our world. We have to look at what we've got and use it to recover. That's exactly what Noah did. Before I pray with you today, I wanna to tell you an interesting story about someone who kept going, no matter about making mistakes, no matter what he lost. A violinist by the name of Paganini, very well known during the 1800s, played to packed concert halls, was highly acclaimed and esteemed, has become extremely famous as one of the best violent players ever to have lived. And one night he played before a packed house, picked up his violin, and as he began to play, the first string on the violin broke. And the crowd gasped because they thought, oh dear, now this is, this is a disaster. But he just continued to play on the three remaining strings. Well, lo and behold, as he was playing on the three remaining strings, another string broke. And the crowd now shocked and audibly made a noise again, you know, sighing and ooh, you know. And he, he just continued to play on two strings and managed to play the full uh, piece of music he was playing on two strings. But lo and behold, can you believe it? A third string broke. And the crowd thought, well, that was the end of it. He's going to have to go off stage, reload the violin, you know, restring it. Then to the amazement of the people in the audience, Paganini stepped forward and he said with a violin in his hand, ladies and gentlemen, one string and Paganini. And I want to quote to you what happened with one string. He produced music as it had never before been heard. He made it sing like, like a nightingale, weep like a woman in distress, while melody was as a chorus of angel 
voices. And they say when he sat down, the applause was wonderful. Women wept for joy and men shouted at the top of their voices. You see, it's not what you've lost, it's what you've got left and what you do with what you've got left and how you live through challenging and devastating times. And we have got more than a violin with one string. We've got the God of heaven who has saved us and brought us through this time for a purpose. And you know, today I want to remind you that God has got an ark. And it's interesting, the word in the Hebrew for ark is, is the word lifeboat, actually. It's not just boat, it's lifeboat. And the, the ark that God has got today is the church. It is the lifeboat. And you know, if you come into the church, you can be saved from the future destruction and devastation. And guess who the door on the ark is? It's Jesus. And you know, they say that Noah filled the ark with all the animals, but God shut the door. And today, Jesus is the door into the church. If you believe in him, you come in and you're saved from devastation. And at the moment, the church is not open as, it, as in physically, but it's open to anyone who would come through the door Jesus and come inside and save themselves from the coming devastation and destruction that is coming when the world comes to an end. And we can come through Christ and God is waiting at the moment, but there's coming a day when he'll shut the door. We need to make sure we get in that we're part of the church, we're part of the household of God, and that we're on that lifeboat, and that we're rebuilding our lives and trusting Him for a great future. If today you've never prayed the prayer of salvation, never opened your heart to Jesus, I want to encourage you to come to the door. He says, I am the door. And if you come through me, you will go in and out and you will find pasture. And many people have come to Christ, come in and joined the church. It's not perfect. Just like Noah, people would make mistakes but God uses it to save the world. Maybe today you need to invite Christ into your life and become part of that household, the lifeboat of God. If you'd like to do that, I'd like to pray with you today. Come pray with me and the prayer will come up on the screen so that you can follow along. Father, I come to you today and I thank you for Christ Jesus, the door into salvation. Thank you for the ark, the church, that I can go through the door and come into and be saved and find safety from the coming judgment. I give you my heart and give you my life and ask you to make me new, Lord. Save me and give me new life. Save me from the coming devastation and judgment that's coming on the world. And I give you my life today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there we go. You've prayed a prayer. Pray to prayer of salvation. God knows your heart and you've asked him to make you a part of the kingdom. Now you need to make a journey and you'll see on our screen there's a QR code that you can click on or you can go onto our website, click on the salvation button and there you can discover what it means to make a journey with God. You know, we've been through a time of devastation but there's coming a great devastation in the future when God is going to bring the heavens and the earth to a close and you need to make sure you're saved and you belong to him. If you're a believer today, let's get out and let's get on with it. But let's be cautious. Let's save. Let's learn lessons from what we've been through. And if you've lost everything, don't give up hope. Trust God. His principles still work and we can get going again and trust Him for blessing. Keep watching online. Stay safe and keep watching for announcements. And we trust in God that it won't be long before we're all back together again and we can kick off with momentum in live in-person church. Until then, God bless you.